Cool. Um, well, my name is Mark, Mark Eden, uh, Gabriel. So uh, we are from Workflow, and we want to talk about basically one real life applications problem. And one of the problems we have most of the time is that nowadays we have a lot of frameworks, and JavaScript is so awesome, and you have like AngularJS, a lot of applications going on. But what happens if you have like 10 years old code base that try to kind of improve, 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 and then all of a sudden, you need to change the whole structure behind it. So the problem is, it's quite easy, okay, rewrite the whole code, but if you have to rewrite almost like one million of lines of code, I don't think it's really that easy. So we have that experience, and what we're going to do is try to explain with you or share with you our experiences, the challenges, and maybe some of you might have the same situations, and you can ask, it's more interactive discussions, feel free to stop any times for any questions. Gabriel, there you go. Uh, well, small advertising share about who is workflow, just very, very quick. Uh, we're a self-owned company developing deploying consulting HR applications based in Vienna. Founded in 2000 and uh, we're delivering HR applications, uh, not only on-premise but also on, in the cloud and also for small and medium companies who may be also interesting for you, like time recording, time management, stuff like that. And today we are going to talk about the evolution of that product actually. So we're making some kind of architectural striptease. Don't worry, I don't, don't take off my clothes, but I will sh uh, let you show under the hood of our product how it's uh, made of and uh, what we're trying to, to achieve and how finally we did it. Okay. Well, can you go back to the previous slide? Huh? Why that picture? Uh, yeah, why that picture? Actually, it's the, the view out of, of, of our office, and uh, this is kind of really legacy building block here. It's not removable at all, and it's really stable. And uh, yeah, it's uh, similar to our code base, more or less. So you can't throw it away and just rebuild it. It's just not possible. So um, on the abstract, we like to talk about. Uh, Okay, let me go with that microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, the abstract is basically uh, the initial situation, the architecture behind it, the requirement, which means like if you have some application 10 years ago, no one cares about mobile phone and user experience that much. So, how do you manage it after 10 years now? So, there's some, some challenges you have to face, definitely. Um, the technical options we have, and then you choose one solution, definitely. And, the lesson learned, we have to discuss about it. Okay, so the initial architecture. We have a 10-year-old Java web application. Um, we started with Java 1.4, so without any generics and all that stuff. And uh, currently we're now at Java 1.7, struggling at the moment to incorporate also Java 1.8, but have some problems with our hundreds of frameworks, which we are depending on. And uh, we have a three-layer traditional server-side web app, so two-tier application in terms of database and uh, one GBM. Uh, we have approximately 25,000 end users uh, in 70 plus systems, installations uh, on-premise at the client or uh, in our cloud. And uh, we have a stateful UI framework, so more traditional like GSF and that stuff, um, using different patterns like uh, MVC, MVC plus, or also, uh, sorry, uh, MVP. And obviously also using different JavaScript libraries, which are most of the time just doing what the server says. Can you show me some of the metrics? Yeah, sure. <coughs> so, yeah, a million lines of code, approximately, I made these metrics a few days ago. Um, has nothing to do with quality, only with quantity, obviously. Um, but we try to, over the 10 years, always refactor and uh, try to keep clean code uh, possible where, where, you know, uh, where it's possible. And uh, we have also continuous integration running. We have about 6,000 tests running um, each day. And um, 1,800 are of them, of those are integration, front-end, and uh, you know, system integration tests. Um, 
and about 4,000 um, something are running on each commit. Um, the build time is uh, quite long, the nightly build. So if all the tests are running with this integration stuff, you know, Selenium tests are not, not that fast. Um, the compile only build is about 30 minutes. And uh, the deployment um, artifacts are a web app, which is running in Tomcat or Jetty or whatever you like. And uh, we also built three mobile apps. So we have already some experience with taking some of the functionality also to mobile phones. But only mobile phones, no tablets, no other devices. Um, and that we did with um, HTML5 in Cordova, so no native development because we're only a small team and we don't have so much resources and possibilities, financial possibilities. So yeah, that's the metrics. And uh, architectural view. Well, it's kind of old traditional web application a stack. You have a relational database, you have some more mapper. In that case, it's the most popular one, Hibernate, which is probably used by most of, of you guys, which were developing something like this. Um, yeah, we used Spring from, from the first day, and uh, this wiring up our Spring services, and this returns domain model, domain model of Pochos. And uh, in the front end, this is running on the server most time. Uh, we have uh, Apache Cocoon, an ancient framework. Um, who of you knows Apache Cocoon? Awesome. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, it was uh, a very innovative framework, uh, let's say, 10 years ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's still, it's very powerful actually, and uh, for all of our requirements it gave us some possibilities, so that's why we never dropped it. And uh, yeah, we also have some experience with JavaScript, uh, really for, for form logic, and uh, our experience was really bad. It was running on the server the first time, then later on we completely changed it to Java to have type safeness and all, all that stuff. Um, and uh, the rest is running here. You know, you have some views. So the views are in some in your own language, more or less. So you have some macros, you have some custom tags, and um, this abstraction of the view later on gets um, interpreted and transformed into the real HTML5 which is then um, fed to the browser. Oh, so if I can ask one question. So after I have this kind of 10 years code architecture behind it and the whole frameworks, how does it look like in real life? Yeah, yeah, that's a little bit. Yeah, that's actually uh, the application itself. So it's uh, my timesheet. And uh, we have this uh, menu here on, on the left-hand side, which is uh, very configurable. Oh, hover skin. <laughs> Hopefully not now. Okay. And uh, yeah, the problem with this application is it's very, very customizable and configurable. So consultants can do a lot. They can say, okay, I want to have, I don't want to have to have these um, actions here. I want to have different. I want to have, to, want to have different icons. I want to have different structure. I want to have different columns. So they can customize almost everything. So it means a lot of uh, logic is inside those controllers which take up the UIs. So, um, then the question is, the previous screenshot is basically like how it looks in real life. Then comes, now you have like a mobile phone and tablets and the reality is that screenshot can never fit on any kind of smart, uh, uh, smartphone so far. Then it need basically to improve it to make it more responsive and making the whole code base responsive and which is not built on top of AngularJS or any kind of HTML5 at the beginning becomes more a challenge. And that's the main challenge basically face. And at, at the beginning, it was quite easy. Like, oh, in three months, you can finish it. And the real story is more than one year still under, under development. And there's a lot of challenges. And I think it can help with it, definitely. So, uh, oh, sorry. Good. So, you want to make it responsive? OK. And yeah, the most usual, usual way, you have definitely the design how a developer things should be, and this is how the user experience is. Which means at the end of the day, we design something that the end user think like, uh, I'd rather go this way than going all the way to the car. So which means we have to find a UX that's more or less user-friendly, intuitive, intelligent. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's not bothering the user. No extra stuff which is not needed, obviously. You want to be as fast as possible, no extra click. And uh, yeah, UX really pays off. So that's the, the killer, killer app, more or less, in these days. Because everybody has a mobile phone, and uh, you only use those apps which are really easy, otherwise are thrown instantly away. You're not touching it, and uh, so that's obviously also a big requirement for future development. And uh, in that case, it was kind of uh, also not only making it responsive, but also to improve the user experience. So, what are the technical options that you have? Well, uh, actually, obviously, rewriting, rewriting the UI. I mean, we had at least uh, three-layered um, application architecture, so that would mean to rewrite the user interface completely. And there were actually two options. Option one would have been uh, to use some fancy JavaScript framework like AngularJS, Ember, whatever, and to communicate with the server only with some REST endpoints and to get the JSON data and have a single page app, obviously. Um, that's something we thought would be probably very useful and very nice, but we did not have the resources to do it, to be honest. Um, Second option would have been to go more the server-centric approach, uh, also with a single page application, but at this time server-driven. So that means using something like Vadin. You ever heard of Vadin? Who's using Vadin? Oh, some people. Um, so if you have some experience with uh, Swing, SVT, that's a really nice way to create your web application and not bother too much with, with web stuff. We're also using it. Um, sorry. Oops. Um, and uh, yes, that was something we were also considering. Really. The problem with this was still that we would have to rewrite all that stuff which was already in the fuse and um, mark them up again with, with Java code. Um, yeah, so, and the third option, that was actually uh, the one which we finally decided on was the hybrid solution, um, means exactly do not throw away your code, but refactor it and try to enable skinning. So, meaning that you have an old theme, you have a new theme, and the new theme just incorporates all these responsive features and it has new, uh, additional user experience, behaviors, um, it uh, maybe has additional functions, and you can um, kind of smoothly transition to this new skin and all can also uh, get in some users to try out and then uh, if it's in something is not working switch back to the other scheme so that was actually the way to go for us um, also it turned out also this option turned out to be really painful um, actually some discussion was going on um, this is probably general discussion for all of you developers who were building some Java web application, um, what to do in the client. I mean, <coughs> if you have some large scale application with millions of users, and where performance is the killer argument, probably JavaScript is the only way to go. But if you have a smaller internet application, that's not a, a real key issue. So probably if you have a lot of functionality there and you need uh, testability, you need uh, type safety and all that stuff, you would prefer something like Java. And uh, we had actually experience with both because we were also using jQuery Mobile for HTML5 apps. We were using Vadin, GBT for another part of the application. And um, it's an ongoing discussion. <laughs> so, uh then what was basically the, dis uh, the decision matters? How do you come to decide if this one was the best way to go? Yeah, you... maybe uh, there are some points on this on this uh, on this slide which I want to comment on a little bit further. Maybe uh, for us in the future, maybe it makes sense also to to go in this Angular JS direction if the TypeScript Angular JS combo turns out to be really valuable, because then the missing features like type safety are coming. You have battery day support. Um, also with uh, Jasmine uh, and JavaScript, you have combos where you can um, go into testability. So that makes it more feasible, in my opinion. 
Um, still, I mean, for enterprise developers, the debugger in, in Java is a real big argument to go for all your logic in plain Java. Um, yes, so our decision matrix, coming back to this, was then uh, comparing the three options and uh, based on cost. So for us, I mean, the, the client side rewrite um, it's kind of subjective uh, impression, obviously, but would have been very high because we were not uh, skilled JavaScript developers. Um, for the server side, it would still have been high because we would have to rewrite all the views in Java. And uh, for the hybrid solution, it was moderate because uh, actually our views were already abstractions, most of them. So we only had to change the transformations. So obviously, for the cost point of view, the hybrid wins. For the maintainability, client side, well, if you want to refactor, type safety, all that stuff, not really there. For server side, <coughs> hi, okay, everything is in Java, fine. For the hybrid stuff, well, medium, because we still have all that XML stuff, XSLT stuff. What about the possible stuff in the future? Obviously here, that's the way to go. That's also why it's really future-proof, in my opinion, because um, you know, for the big application, cloud application, everything is going client-side. For uh, the server-side stuff, getting the, the, the real um, the, the trained people here is probably not so, uh, so, so easy. And for the hybrid stuff, it's not that hard, actually, because, I mean, we have a home-baked solution with this Apache Cocoon, but on the other hand, similar to uh, lots of other traditional um, server-side processing, HTML generation stuff like GSF or Wicked or stuff like that. And uh, yeah, future-proof, is that future-proof? Good question. Uh, performance is top, obviously, for the client side. For server-side, immediate hybrid, medium, let's say. Um, and that was also a killer argument for us. Um, we can easily, we can smoothly transition our application. Because um, as long, when we developed this uh, new skin and we bring this into production, um, we can decide when the, the, the customer will switch then to the new version. And uh, we have no code applications. So we just have two different skins. Um. On that point, uh, I want to mention something. Uh, basically, how many people have come to that situation in life where you have to make decision if you have to rewrite the whole code base or you have to improve the existing one? Exactly. So, I want three people, tell me your experience. What was the best option for you? Your person. We have not yet decided. <laughs> <laughs> and, and why? Um, we, 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 we could not really identify the, 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 the risks and uh, we, we, we still were not able to, to identify the, 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 the amount of money and people needed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Someone else over there? Uh, yeah. yeah. We just finished the project that lasted about seven months now. Okay. And we Refactured it basically for the first one and a half months, two months, and realized it was absolutely the worst day I thought, dropped it completely, started from scratch, finished in time. Awesome. Someone else already seen about that? Okay, please, you, that's in the show. Um, we completely rewrote it, okay. um, but chose for, for a few months to, to, to have both frameworks running on the client at the same time. Mm -hmm. Basically, few by few replace it. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, how, how, how big is the code base, basically? Was it something that put it I, I, I couldn't tell okay. in, in, in lines of code, but basically there were six people full time working and one, one and a half management mm -hmm. positions full time. Okay. For 
a few years already working, so it was a larger project. Okay. Because in this case, basically, you have a component of how many views you have? Here? We have 250 UIs and about 100 configuration UIs. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's enough. Uh, rewriting it basically can take years. And if you have basically a lot of time using it in real time, and you don't have enough resources, which is really important. If you don't have the resources, then you are stuck. So you need to find the best way to go. And yeah. as you said, it, the, this is not that easy. The wish will not be to go like, a, let's go hybrid. You might want to rewrite everything to make it more smooth. But then, if you don't have the resources for it, you need to find the middle way to go. And that was basically our case. Going to the next point. So, please, Gabriel. Yeah, actually, we had a feature toggle now, um, we, which where you can choose um, is the, the application or skin enabled or not in EBS, and the user can switch between the skins. And um, from the technical point of view, we needed to separate all the code generation, the markup generation, um, which is responsible for layout. So we needed some JavaScript, obviously, are only for DOM manipulation there. So we need to separate them from um, form logic. And um, so we have also different frameworks by skin. For example, the classic one we use, jQuery UI, but in the um, responsive one, we, need, uh, we use Bootstrap <coughs> and also we have some different behaviors and, and functions by skin. So basically we have a base architecture, base layer of JavaScript and CSS, and then on top of, the, of this we have a skin layer. And uh, looking at the markup, how is it generated? The application programmer has this abstraction where you generate the form, and uh, then you have this the classic way how it's, it's generated with a, a transformation of classic component, and this is the responsive version where we use strip classes. So that means also the application programmer is not concerned about um, any CSS classes to use in the end. And so once again, the screenshot from the old version, from the old skin. And this is the skin, the new skin, the new responsive skin. Also with uh, uh, this uh, menu which can uh, be sandwiched here uh, or completely uh, hidden like on the mobile view here. And it's still the same application code, it's just uh, the transformation layer in between has been replaced. And um, the good thing about it when you go hybrid is that first of all we mentioned one point which is the resources. You have enough resources. And another point was that based on the experience we have with Google, which basically is no more basically developed further, uh, it's a bit risky to take any kind of frameworks nowadays, maybe in JavaScript and put into productions. And after two years, you realize that shit, it's no more working. And if you put already a kind of framework into productions and it's really used widely, changing is not that easy. It's, it's involved a lot of cost. So we try to find one of the most easiest way and future proof frameworks and we go with very basic <coughs> Chita Bootstrap which we believe is, is, is still useful for the next at least five, ten years. I pray God for that. And we still have a lot of Bootstrap plugins. We use data table, JS, font awesome for the icons and jQuery basic table. So those are the main core frameworks that we use to cement the whole transition to responsive. So we didn't try to either like a lot of JavaScript frameworks that not needed. We basically use basically what's already on the platform. And all of them run on top of jQuery. So with jQuery and Twitter Bootstrap, we try to refurbish everything, making some more view changes with that is Yeah, so the lessons learned actually. Uh, start with the prototype, how you should your UI should look like if you want to refurbish it and then uh, try to integrate it in your skin. Um, try to encapsulate your UI components, which are rendered, so that you can, com by component, maybe find a better implementation, like instead of jQuery UI dialog, you need to use some Bootstrap dialog, instead of your home-baked table, use maybe some table component. Um, also enforce the try principle. Don't repeat yourself, encapsulate everything, modularize everything. And uh, which also helped us a lot was making uh, example UIs so that we can uh, 
quality ensure that uh, nothing is broken if you change something because you obviously you have to, to support the two skins. Um, also to have this icon catalog because you have uh, you know some symbols mean something for the user and for the the new skin we have uh, some other icons so it was needed to to give them a symbolic name and to reference uh, everything with a symbolic name. What else? We had a skin object in the code available which uh, holds all the information about the skin, about its capabilities, and it should be available in all layers of your code so that you can reference it. Um, very crucial is also the organization of CSS, obviously in any web project, in a, any bigger one, very integrate different JavaScript <coughs> and CSS libraries. So maybe have your own prefix per module or by functionality. Um, yeah, different implementations of skin-specific UX behavior based on some signature. We <coughs> turned out that we had some, you know, all the layout-specific JavaScript was uh, put into a module, and that module had a signature, and there were two implementations per skin. So key point is also <coughs> treat JavaScript as first-class enterprise code, obviously. Automate what can be automated, user encapsulation and abstraction. Um, very important use namespaces. So because in larger projects you end up with uh, lots of JavaScript. And uh, I mean, we do not have so much JavaScript, but still about 50,000 lines of code. And uh, yeah, you don't want to have any clashes and you want to keep this also well organized and documented. And uh, can't stress this enough, write front-end tests. And do the same like you do it with your Java code, refactor, document, test, and proof. Good. Uh, any questions? Yeah, Have you ever thought of bringing a uh, like JavaScript developer on the team who's like fully focused on JavaScript? Oh, good question, good question. The reason why I'm asking is uh, many of the things, how you evaluate things, seem to me very much like the Java UI things. Mm -hmm. um, there are many people from the JavaScript side who believe you can write good code without, types, uh, without uh, strict types, mm -hmm. these kind mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. And it's very much the, like the Java view because you come from there, of course, you think that's, that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, I would think that if you have someone coming from the front end, you might have a very different view of things. OK, the question was uh, if we have a sort of bringing in a, a JavaScript expert to the team to um, have a more balanced view of the options and maybe um, so that uh, we are not that uh, Java based in our mindsets, more or less. And uh, yeah, we, from a year ago, we tried to put more emphasis also and put more resources into JavaScript. But to be honest, we don't have a JavaScript expert, a real Java expert in, in, in our company. Um, probably also because we had this uh, bad experience uh, years ago where we had uh, used JavaScript also on the server and where we had lots of problems. And those problems were easily solved by just using a typed language with debugger and everything. You know, So we have this kind of. But there are good debuggers in JavaScript. I would, <laughs> I would argue that if you work in Google Chrome, for example, in a Yeah, Google very Chrome is nice. Yeah, true, true. Now, now, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, now, yeah. I remember the times where you had to debug this alert. That, was, that sucks. <laughs> I agree. I mean, yeah. Google Chrome debugger is, is wonderful. It's really awesome, yeah. And by the way, uh, I kind of agree that the uh, type safety is, is uh, two types are not, not like the silver bullet. If you have really good tests, it's just as good. So uh, yeah, I've been, I've been a C plus plus guy, strict type, and I also did other uh, strong type languages, and in the end I, I ended up with script languages because uh, they're value type languages because that a lot, a lot easier to work with. Them. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you, re you really have to take seriously that you're writing tests. It's, it's not that bad if you don't have types. Yeah, the problem with tests in JavaScript is also this is something which is evolving. I mean, 
Um, there are some standards which are coming up. I mean, and we also use some judgment tests for, I think, half of a year or so, something like this. But, um, you know, there were different approaches, and uh, but not real real standards, like there are in the Java world. But that is, that is JavaScript. There will never be real standards in JavaScript, mm -hmm. because it's so fast evolving. Mm -hmm. The reason why there are so many standards in Java is because it's a stable system for many, many years. Sure. And, and, and JavaScript is constantly evolving and changing all the time. Jasmine is out for many years, but the standards will always change. Mm -hmm. so, if I may, I would disagree with you. It does not evolve, it's dead. It was already for Netscape 47 to 1998 in JavaScript, and basically didn't evolve so much. Well, no, no, I'm not talking yeah. about the language JavaScript from a talk, I'm so talking about the ecosystem of JavaScript. Yeah, that's true. And the ecosystem yeah. changes a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Agree with you. Regarding your, your um, test pipelines that you mentioned at the beginning, um, you wrote the whole testing process, the integration process, um, needs four hours. Um, now that you're using something like Twitter Bootstrap or whatever, did you set up some um, asset pipelines like gives you run, scout, whatever, and how did they step up? Okay, the question was if we used some ground scout pipelines for the JavaScript stuff. And the uh, question is no. Uh, we, that's true. Uh, as you said, we're coming more from the Java side, so we have our, our, our JUnit tests and um, Selenium uh, on top of JUnit. And uh, so, um, yeah, we're probably not that, we're more than Java experts in trying to get this done more or less, all that stuff, uh, with the techniques and the, and, the, and the tools we have, to be honest, yeah. So, uh, getting it from a completely other perspective would have been brought us maybe in a completely different direction, I agree. Last question and then you can enjoy your break. <laughs> yeah. Why does your compile time last 30 minutes? The compile appears, uh, you mentioned it last 30 minutes. Why does it last so long? Why does it last so long? If you have a bug, then uh, uh, the tester will go home if you, if you have to wait for the <laughs> No, that's not a problem actually, because uh, you can always make a hotfix directly from Eclipse, and then you just uh, pass the, the class file. It's no problem. And I mean, you update it on the server, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can also always do that. I mean, the, the build time, in, I mean, it's a 60 Maven project, and they run through, and they compile on a, on a Jenkins Hudson, so it just takes time, just to the, the size of the project. You don't think of having a dependent project? Well? Yeah, we have 16, so I can only compile, obviously, the, the small Maven project, and then it will be only maybe one minute or so. Sure. Thank you. Okay.